Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ambassador Mark Green, and I have the honor of leading the Wilson Center. So as many of you know, the Wilson Center is a unique institution in foreign policy, congressionally chartered, scholarship-driven, and fiercely independent and nonpartisan. And I think that special status brings with it special obligations to not duplicate what others are doing, but instead to prioritize the most important issues and opportunities and to do so in ways that can add value and make a difference. That's why the center recently launched a new cross-cutting line of research on the topic of enterprise diplomacy. Our goal is to shape conversations and inspire meaningful action on the technological, economic, and policy-based underpinnings of economic statecraft and diplomacy. And the Joseph B. Gildenhorn Fellowship for Enterprise Diplomacy is at the heart of that approach. It will provide opportunities for top experts from business, academia, journalism, and government to elevate the economic statecraft conversation and at the same time continue Ambassador Gildenhorn's remarkable legacy. As chairman of the Wilson Center's board, Ambassador Gildenhorn was instrumental in this institution's progress. He led it through a series of transitions. He guided its first strategic planning process. And as someone reminded me earlier today, working with Lee Hamilton, he even worked to free Dr. Hale Esfandiari, who was then imprisoned in a prison in Iran. Ambassador Gildenhorn was an extraordinary diplomat, philanthropist, business leader, and family man. But he never compartmentalized his values. Instead, he used his integrity and compassion to guide all that he did. And his actions were always directed at improving the quality of life for his community and for the world. Like Ambassador Gildenhorn, I firmly believe that for the U.S. to achieve its goals in the international arena and to improve the chances for peace and prosperity, government must work hand in hand with business. As we observe how other powers, authoritarian powers, throw their weight around trying to unravel the rules-based order and the growth of market e economies, I know it's easy to become discouraged. There are some out there who are even suggesting that the U.S. can't compete. Nonsense. That's simply not true or even close. Private enterprise is still the greatest power on earth for lifting lives and building communities. And the U.S. is still the world's most innovative and dynamic economy. Not because of government, mind you, oftentimes in spite of it, but the public sector can help out. And it can play a role that's constructive, that helps to foster the conditions and the predictability that businesses often need. It's not about government intervention. That rarely, if ever, works but about collaboration, looking for those areas where interests align, opening doors and fostering conversations, economic statecraft and enterprise diplomacy. These terms, of course, are now inextricably linked to the memory of Joe Gildenhorn, who understood and exemplified how business and government leaders could work together to lift the human condition. It's why the Wilson Center has this fellowship and why we're all here today. Our first panel has two leaders who have worked tirelessly over the years to advance America's interests in ways that promote global peace and prosperity. Senator Roy Blunt is our inaugural Gildenhorn Fellow, a longtime supporter of American leadership, trade, and private enterprise. Looking back over his work in the House and the Senate, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch wrote that he has, quote, one of the most conservative voting records, yet always avoids the confrontational firebrand style. In fact, his most significant legislative accomplishments all had Democratic co-sponsors. Our other guest is former World Bank President David Mulpass. He has been a Wall Street economist, Deputy Assistant Secretary at both Treasury and State, and he's now a distinguished fellow at Purdue University's Mitch Daniels School of Business. A recent essay in Forbes magazine called him the, quote, man who turned around the World Bank. Not bad. 
<laughs> they're great friends of Wilson. They're great friends of mine. I am delighted to have them here. Now, before we continue on, I want to take a moment to thank Alma Gildenhorn, who's joining us here today. Alma, it's an honor to have you with us and to continue honoring Ambassador Gildenhorn's legacy and impact. I'd like to welcome you to the stage if you'd like to offer a few words. I just, <clears throat> good afternoon. I just want to tell you what a thrill this is for me, but more than that, what a great honor it was for my husband, uh, just several months before he passed away, to be honored with this significant tribute, a fellowship for enterprise diplomacy in his name. I'll never forget that what the evening was over and we were coming home, he said, you know, in a lifetime of work and a lifetime of recognition and a lifetime of just being part of this community, I can't think of anything that has given me such joy. He said, I've never sat in an audience where everything that I believed in was opened up for me, and I was so honored. He said, I'll never forget any part of this evening. It really gives me some reason to continue on. He, and he would have been here today and very, very proud. His great friends, David Malpass and Roy Blunt, two people who he deeply respected for their intelligence and integrity, uh, are here today to talk about the program. This would have given him so much pleasure. So I congratulate you, Senator Blunt. Joe thought so much of you. He really did. He had respected you, and he felt that you were a wonderful, wonderful leader. And he knew before he left us that you would be the inaugural fellow. And to David Malpass, he did turn the World Bank around, and he's turning everything around that he's ever done. He is a superb, superb friend and gentleman. So thank you so much. So I'll also say the Gildenhorns, uh, throughout my time, uh, Joe never missed listening in on a program we were doing. And when it comes to our work with scholars and fellows, as everyone in the center knows, Alma Gildenhorn is the most engaged person at the Wilson Center, thoughts and ideas, and has made us much better in everything that we do. So Alma and Joe, both tremendous contributions. I will now turn it over to our director of the Asia program, Shohoko Goro who will moderate our first panel. After their conversation, we're delighted to bring you a panel on the same topic, bringing representatives from the private sector to give us their take on how the U.S. government and business can work more closely. Shahoko, take it away. It's all yours. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, and, and thank you so much, um, Senator Blunt and, and uh, President Mopas, for joining us today. I'd like to start the conversation with uh, perhaps an uncomfortable truth. Trade has become a dirty word here in Washington. We've seen a lot of disruptions to the global economy as a result of COVID, as a result of Chinese um, manipulation of um, uh, its own economic advantages in the global, global economy. Uh, and, but at the same time, what we are seeing in response to those disruptions here in the United States is a focus on bringing back resilience to the United States, resilience to disruptions, resilience to um, economic coercion by authoritarian regimes. Then as we look at some of the um, policies that the United States is taking on, um, we see um, concern about the rise of industrial policy in the United States that 
Um, perhaps the United U.S. economy is so big, it's so strong that it and it has enough resources and enough manpower that it can afford to isolate itself and not be as um, uh, interdependent on the global economy. Senator Blunt, how do you look at this U.S. reluctance to take on new trade deals? And how can the United States remain economically competitive whilst being a good global citizen? Well, thank you, um, Shahoka. That's a great question. I'm going to get right to it. First, let me say how pleased I am uh, to be the first uh, Gildenhorn Fellow. Um, about 20 years ago at a dinner, and I still remember this evening, um, Alma Gildenhorn was my dinner partner, and it was wonderful. Well-read, well-versed in so many things. I told Abby when we were leaving, I want to spend more time with Alma Gildenhorn. <laughs> and Abby said, I suppose that means we'll spend more time with Ambassador Gildenhorn, too. And that is really the moment that our close friendship started. Uh, and uh, so honored to have been asked to do this, so glad that uh, that decision was made before we lost the ambassador, and uh, glad to be here tonight. This is a topic I care a lot about. When Mark uh, Green and uh, others were in the Congress with me, we were still at a fairly high level on trade. Now, it had become more and more partisan over time. Um, NAFTA, much more bipartisan vote than all the trade votes uh, that followed. Uh, every time we've thought in our country that uh, we were big enough and strong enough to be independent of the rest of the world, that's always turned out to be a huge mistake. Uh, because while you might, that might possibly work, because we are big and we are strong and we are diverse, uh, but isolating yourself from the world economically also isolate yourself from the world in so many other ways. If there's a heart of the concept that I believe I'm beginning to develop in my mind because of this fellowship of, um, of enterprise diplomacy, uh, that has to include economic partnerships, economic outreach. You know, I would think, for instance, as we look at the world, I'm almost a, with some restrictions on national security, my view has been almost always to be virtually a pure free trader. And we're clearly not there in the country today. And when we step back, that leaves a vacuum for other people to step in. T TPP would be an example. Um, even if there were things wrong with the agreement, I think our friends in, in the Indo-Pacific were so eager for us to be part of that, those things could have been worked out. Uh, and if we were present in TPP, the things that we bring to the table, uh, the rule of law, the idea that every, every agreement, every economic opportunity has to have a positive ending for both people involved, uh, because we always want to have the second opportunity to do business. There's no, in our view, has never been, as a, as a people, though individually there could be exceptions, has never been uh, that we're going to have one big deal and we'll never see you again. Uh, it's been just the opposite. We're going to start a relationship, uh, and those relationships are good for both sides, but they're particularly good for our less advantaged friends in the world as we try to use enterprise diplomacy, Alma, uh, to, to help them elevate themselves. And to do that, we not only need to be able to sell them things, we need to be able to have a two-way uh, commerce and a two-way friendship and relationship with them. And so I, I think we're in a bad place right now on trade, and I hope we find a, a better way to move forward. But David spent a lot of time, of course, on this issue. Right. Thanks. And also, before starting, just uh, I'm honored to be here and uh, wanted to say how Joe and, and constantly with Alma, uh, we're always trying to build and improve things. So that includes institutions like the Wilson Center and institutions like University of Maryland and uh, the Kennedy Center and so on. Uh, but it also means building uh, enterprise diplomacy and concepts and, of course, physical buildings. Uh, and uh, so I'm honored to be here and uh, I really uh, wanted to congratulate you. This topic uh, of, of enterprise diplomacy is central to where the world's going. So this is a 
the fabulous uh, 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 fabulous partnership or engagement by the Wilson Center and Mark Green in in how to build how to build this uh, this whole practice. Um, it, it, so we're launching right into one of the toughest issues, and it, it's been around since uh, time, uh, all through time, of how do you trade and how does the dominant uh, uh, economy trade. So I, I only want to add to the to the complexity that Roy mentioned uh, the the um, the challenge of. If the U.S. is able to grow more, it creates more opportunities. So one of the one of the challenges right now, uh, global growth is slowing again. It slowed in 2023. It's slowing further in 2024. World Bank just did a report a week ago uh, showing world growth down to 2.4 percent, which, uh, given all of the people that are way below poverty lines uh, is simply not enough. And so it means you're trying to di divide up a shrinking pie. So whatever challenge you thought was there on trade, and it's been there for, for a long time, it's made uh, uh, harder by that. In the, in the uh, new projections out, it shows 2025 barely better than 2024. So you have this uh, a uh, huge challenge for the world of investment isn't occurring in the places that need the investment. So then how do you create uh, trade or competitiveness uh, where there's simply not enough of anything to go around? And I think that's one of the, one of the problems. So I'm hopeful that the U.S. can have policies that will really spur growth and make the country more competitive, and that allows it then to make uh, logical decisions on investment, on trade. On, on all of the issues that are facing the government. So we see this um, vacuum um, being created by the United States, leaving many, you know, being very hesitant to take on new trade agreements. And that is being filled by China, that China has ironically become more of a champion of multilateral trade deals. It's also stepped up and, and invested more in the global south and emerging markets through its um, Belt and Road Initiative, amongst other um, investment instruments as well. We're just coming off um, the gathering of um, the at Davos, the World Economic Forum, the titans of industry. We're in this, um, the slopes of Switzerland talking about big um, cross-border issues, including um, energy security, food security, um, but also um, this big idea, um, big issue that the World Bank is um, deeply involved in, which is about environmental sustainability and decarbonization. Um, Senator Blunt, if I can first turn to you um, to um, hear your views about how private enterprise, how American companies can actually be part of the solution in investing um, in green technologies, both here in the United States and overseas. And uh, Mr. Malpass, if I can ask you perhaps to talk about the role that international financial institutions can play in um, harnessing that kind of um, sustainable growth. Well, we, we have great resources and great energy resources. I, I do think this is, a, this is a time when we need to rethink uh, how we use those resources, how we move away from some of those resources. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a rethinking of nuclear uh, as one of the answers that uh, we, that particularly Europe has moved away from. But I think uh, there's a, a need to look at, look at that. Uh, I really believe that the all of the above strategy is one that works pretty well as a transition strategy, uh, and the government shouldn't have to subsidize energy for a long period of time, but there are some places where the government does come in and provide the subsidies necessary to be competitive, and I don't have a problem with that. I do have a problem when it becomes obvious that that particular thing is never going to be competitive without government subsidization when there are other things available uh, that need to be looked at more clearly. Uh, but the funding and the financing, of course, from the World Bank perspective is going to make a difference, and we have a chance to lead here. We're comfortable with our own energy, uh, but we can see some of the environmental challenges that that provides, and I think there's a real opportunity for us to, to lead this discussion and that we should. 
Um, you started with the China challenge, which I think is, uh, is present in all of the issues that you mentioned. They're very effective at uh, negotiating within the multilateral setting. Uh, so that applies to the Paris Agreement, to the G20, to the Davos Forum, and so on down the list. It has to do with their um, care in details, so that you know you they they uh, more than adequately staff the various international organizations. So w the the a part of the challenge for the U.S. within its competitiveness is to try to be effective within these groups. I saw it in in every part of what I did at the World Bank. For example, on the debt issue, uh, which is where China has lent a lot of money to poor country to developing countries to build things and to uh, uh, to extend its market uh, market connections then w as the, as the G20 took over the issue the the words were carefully written to, to be heavily favorable to China. Uh, and so one of the challenges for the U.S. is to up its game within those, uh, within those contexts. Uh, as you apply that to the green uh, issues, one of the big challenges is to have a cost-benefit analysis for, for the goals. So as the U.S. looks at its goal, the way the um, much of the climate uh, uh, issue is being handled now, it's to maximize the amount of spending rather w without really any evidence of reduction in greenhouse gas emission. And the big beneficiary of that spending has been China so far and looks like it will continue to be China. So as the issue is, uh, is propelled through the uh, Davos Forum and others, uh, the, the, uh, the, the biggest beneficiary by far has been uh, China in, in that regard. And so again, I think it's an opportunity and a challenge to, to the U.S. to up its game uh, and to be more effective within using these uh, institutions. One of the prob problems, and I think it's one that we really need to deal with, is as as uh, the various forums work toward global government, and we need to be clear that's really the direction that's heading of the G20, of the Financial Stability Board, of the way WTO is set up, the World Trade Organization, the International Labor Organization. They're all uh, uh, creating a rules-based framework uh, where uh, uh, it creates these big opportunities for China because it operates on a different scale within the rules-based uh, framework, whether that's on trade, intellectual property, labor rights. Uh, and so these are all issues for us to uh, uh, think about or to, to really work through. Um, as far as the World Bank, then, um, what, uh, what we did was uh, create a climate change action plan that was based on some cost-benefit uh, 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 consideration. So it launched a big set of reports, country by country, of what would be best in the interest of the people of the country within the climate space. Part of that is adaptation, meaning it, it, uh, as, as climate changes occur in the world, our people in poorer countries prepared for that uh, and can lives be saved by that preparation. So that, that's an important part of the uh, World Bank spending. There was, we doubled the spending on climate. They're going further now. And the challenge then comes, and Roy mentioned, uh, the, the challenge for people in many parts of the world is they don't have electricity, they don't have clean water or health care uh, or, uh, or education. The literacy rates are going down and the poverty rates going up. So one of the one of the challenges is to find cost effective ways to uh, to meet the the climate goals of the of the world within a context of the limited resources. I'm really worried about the the uh, diversion of the resources, the food and fertilizer. You mentioned the fertilizer challenge and the food challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, th these are giant challenges, and literally what's happening now is money is being taken from child nutrition to be put into, uh, into decarbonization kinds of efforts that are really expensive. So that's the, the point maybe that I'll leave, that there's got to be 
uh, a, a really kind of a, a careful analysis of which kinds of spending are going to have an impact without doing too much harm for ch stunting of children, for the education of girls, which is uh, d a direct the, the countries are really being left with the decision and, and, you know, they grab onto it. You can reduce the education of girls in order to buy more contracts uh, from China. And, and the, the heavy swing is going in that latter direction. Okay. So perhaps I could have one final question um, to you, um, Senator Blunt. It is about what I see as a rise of healthy competition amongst U.S. states for foreign direct investment. Um, we are seeing this, like, hopes and dreams for a silicon heartland. Uh, we are seeing this uh, renewed interest in bringing manufacturing back to the United States and for the United States to maintain its competitive edge as an innovative nation. I'm hoping that you can elaborate a little bit on what makes a state be attractive to foreign investment. Well, I, I think that is an important uh, development as states try to work with uh, companies that are foreign companies to try to get them to locate here. You know, a lot of this relocation was the result of the supply chain problems during COVID. And suddenly everybody began to look at, well, now why, are we, why are we getting things that take so long to get here? Which also, by the way, David, is part of the energy challenge. Uh, you know, the, 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 the energy, the, the suppliers uh, are often the ones that run your energy cost up, your, your ESG cost and other cost up. Uh, and so trying to, to onshore, but as we think about onshore, we also want to, want to think about this other topic of nearshoring. And my friend, the ambassador to Australia, every time this comes up, says, and friendshoring. Uh, and all of that all of that matters, but trying to, to uh, uh, compete for those jobs, we are the best located country in the world. You know, we have these two oceans, we have this great river system in the middle of the country, biggest piece of contiguous agricultural ground in the world is the Mississippi R River Valley. It's the only one that has its own built-in uh, transportation system in that river network. There's nothing else like it in the world for food, but also for transportation. Uh, and the way you, you uh, move things around is effectively done in our country in ways that really other countries can't match. Uh, and uh, to make that case, workforce is important. Utility rates are really important. You know, a lot of things work at today's utility rates that just simply don't work at twice today's utility rates. And it's one of the things that makes those two things, location, transportation, utility, workforce, that whole list of things are the things that all have to work. You know, if, if um, the location is good, that's fine. But if you don't have the workforce, the location doesn't matter. If you don't have utility bills that people can pay and provide the kind of jobs they want to provide and the kind of product they want to provide, location and workforce don't matter. Uh, and so all these things have to come together on the, the energy uh, front again. The things that would be easily achievable in 20 years are disastrous if you try to achieve them in five years. So as we look at where we are on these energy questions, we have to look at a reasonable implementation that doesn't, doesn't jeopardize the economy, make it impossible for families to pay their bills, and often can't be achieved. The only thing you said is a goal that can't be achieved, and everybody begins to back away from the goals that otherwise could be achieved if you weren't putting this big obstacle in the way. And I'm glad to see our, our states competing. They have a lot of reason to compete. These jobs are going to be different than the manufacturing jobs uh, that we, many of which we used to have, we don't have anymore. It'll be better jobs and fewer people. Uh, but then you get the advantage of all of our other advantages of location, utility, and workforce. Thank you. I'm hoping we have time for one or two questions. Um, if you have a question, I believe there is no microphone. I'm so sorry. We can um, hear. Right there's one. Okay. Yes.
do to technological innovation, mechanization, instead of Simon? How much is Simon not displaying incorrectly? Yeah. And it, I think that's, you know, historians will look back and say, was China at the right place at the right time in the early 2000s? Remember that the, what was going on then, the dollar was weakening, China had a stable currency, it made it very attractive for investment, and so Wall Street went, uh, uh, went very aggressively into China. Would that have happened somewhere else if China hadn't been there? Maybe, but China grabbed that and, and uh, added productivity very rapidly. So now we see them uh, dominant in various manufacturing processes, for example, and one that's uh, that is the uh, the refining of rare earth. Uh, uh, the, all the components that go into solar panels are refined within China, and so it gives it a dominant position in that particular technology. So I don't know. I think it's a mix of things that the that uh, the U.S. was uh, m um, moving what was uh, was. Uh, up moving toward uh, financial services and healthcare services at a time when China uh, was grabbing onto the manufacturing services and doing it in a very aggressive way. I want to take a moment. So I'm the only one in the room. One thing. Last week I was uh, at Purdue University in Indiana, which tries to compete with Missouri and other <laughs> other states, and is doing fine with that. Uh, and uh, uh, I saw a. Uh, uh, a, the research reactor at, you, you, Roy mentioned uh, nuclear power, and so we really have to say, you, you know, as you look out 50 years, who, the countries that can really uh, make progress in that area are going to be ahead of the game in terms of competitiveness. So I got a chance to see an inside an operating uh, fissioning reactor where the neutrons were creating a sustainable uh, reaction and, uh, and electricity from it uh, and heat from it, which is very interesting. Now, it's very small, so you don't get any ra radiation, but I had one of those uh, Geiger th those uh, counters on my, on my uh, suit, which showed a big zero, no, 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 no harmful <laughs> radiation. But I just mentioned that as we think about, uh, uh, you know, moments in history and moments in time, then I think it's important for the U.S. to grab uh, the the uh, do a cost benefit analysis and see which kinds of technologies can really push forward. Uh, we're trying to do that with artificial intelligence, which I think is is uh, uh, necessary to figure out how to do that. Uh, and that gets right to the question of China. There, well, I'm sorry, I didn't finish the point. China has is building nuclear reactors at a rapid pace and installing them. And so that's giving them a rapid uh, jump start within the global economy. So as you look at the number of, re if you did a graph of the number of reactors in the world, the U.S. is flat line or going down. China is going rapidly up, which means that they learn the, they get the economy of scale from manufacturing those. I feel like we've just like started the momentum of getting this conversation going, but I'm getting the uh, sign to to uh, move on to the next panel. So um, thank you so much, Senator Blunt, uh, Mr. Malpas, for joining us today, and congratulations again. Thank and thank you so much for being part of the Wilson Center. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Duncan Wood. I'm the Vice President for Strategy and New Initiatives here at the Wilson Center. And if you don't know what that title means, neither do I. Um, but I have a lot of fun doing it. Um, Alma, it's a great, great pleasure to be here today. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity to honor Joe's memory with this. And uh, I have to say, I think we've got a, a, a sterling conversation uh, to follow on from what was an excellent first panel. At the beginning, Ambassador Green talked about areas where interests align. And uh, I think that that's key to the conversation that we're about to have. I want to tell you a little personal story. First of all, I began my career as a lowly academic, um, and I loved it. I lived in an ivory tower, and I thought great thoughts, and nobody listened. And after a while, I became frustrated with that. 
And I looked to the think tank world and I said, oh, these are the people who've got it sorted out because they talk to government. And so I came into the think tank world and I realized that there was a, a great conversation between sort of the intellectuals and the policy makers. And that was all well and good. And there was some you know, fruitful cross fertilization. And then I realized that there was a, a, an element missing. And that, of course, was the private sector. And my work here at the Wilson Center over the last three years um, with Ambassador Green and, and many other colleagues here has been focused on how do we best engage with the private sector to actually produce much more thoughtful and insightful approaches to public policy. Because what I found, and I'm sure that many people here in the room share this, is that it's the, the private sector where the rubber hits the road. You can make all the laws you like, you can think all the great uh, thoughts that you like, but it's the private sector that invariably has to implement those. So I'm delighted that we have with us three excellent representatives of those ideas today. Um, and I want to begin uh, with John Murphy from the Chamber of Commerce. And I want to focus exactly in on that, John, about the areas where interests align. I want to ask you, you know, what is it that you think the private sector needs most from the U.S. government as it operates overseas? How the U.S. government can best support the private sector? But also, and this is the key thing which I think many people don't think about, how does the private sector help achieve U.S. strategic goals internationally? And, and I'm not naive enough to think that interests always align. There are many occasions where they don't. But if you could give us some thoughts about where you see those interests aligning and how they can work together. Well, Duncan, thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor to be here today at the at the launch of the Gildenhorn Fellowship, and uh, I'm honored to have a small part um, in the proceedings here today because of that. Um, I, I think it comes down to it uh, for the American business community that uh, what happens over there matters here. It matters for our competitiveness. It matters for jobs. Um, it's um, as as you heard from the earlier panel. Uh, we know that trade has become something of a dirty word here in Washington, uh, but that doesn't mean that trade isn't delivering the goods every day for the American economy. There are 40 million American jobs that depend on trade today. Half of the output of American manufacturers is for export. Uh, one in four acres on American farms is planted for exports. Uh, you know, our economy simply cannot grow and prosper unless American companies have the ability to access the 95% of the world's consumers that live overseas. And uh, I think it works best, Duncan, when uh, the business community is able to work uh, in concert uh, with our government to seek goals that foster our competitiveness and, uh, and help to grow the economy. And some of this is, is simply the American government doing its, its normal job. Yeah. Uh, you think about embassies. Um, Embassies have an incredibly important role helping American business to tap foreign markets. But when we have long delays in getting ambassadors in place, which um, I'm not saying that that's the fault of just the Congress or just the administration, but the, you know, those delays, those long absences, it's, there's a real cost for American competitiveness. Um, visas, uh, visa wait times uh, has been a real thorn for American business and competitiveness. Um, in some countries around the world, it's a year or two years just to get that interview for, to apply for a business visa. There's been a lot of improvement recently, uh, but still, I was just on the website today. The State Department, is, they've made it a priority, but in some places, it's, it's, it's a year, it's two years in Latin America, in Africa, in India. Um, we need Congress to invest in the international affairs budget. And I'm not just saying that because I'm next to Michelle here with the uh, U.S. Uh, Global Leadership Coalition. That 1% of the budget which funds diplomacy and development, you know, it's, it's critical in so many different ways. Um, but I think the, at the end of the day, I, I do come back to what was uh, stated so eloquently on the earlier panel, which is we need to get back in the game on trade. Um, that 95% of the world's consumers who live outside our markets, uh, the rest of the world has not forgotten that simple fact, uh, just because Washington sometimes pretends that that's not the reality. Um, since the turn of the century, more than 350 new trade agreements have been brought into force around the world. And uh, Washington is, is not moving forward as we should. It's been more than 10 years since we've entered into a new market opening trade agreement. Um, our European friends, they have trade agreements with 80 countries. We've been stuck at 20 for about 10 years now. 
uh, we've got to get back in the game. And I really do think that there's benefits to government there as well in terms of the ability to move forward on strategic priorities. Um, it's, it's trade, but it's also investment. The Biden administration has said that international economic policy today is as much about international investment. And I think that's true. Um, American companies have invested twice as much as Chinese ones in Southeast Asia, for instance, a very important part of the world. Um, and that's really appreciated. It's a really important form of American influence in that part of the world, because, in part because American companies are you know, they're such great employers. When they invest in a country, they bring American values and, and good business practices with them. I don't mean to say that they're all angels. And, you know, they're seeking profit. Uh, but it's certainly a form of American soft power, and we, we should be talking more about how to uh, uh, capture that. I think that's a fascinating element. Uh, the soft power dimension of it is, is critically important. I have also found uh, you know, in, in, in my own interactions with the private sector that, that companies provide a very useful source of uh, on-the-ground intelligence for U.S. government. And you find that there are many, many occasions where a company that is operating in a remote location, or at least remote from Washington, you know, is able to feed back into the policy process. And that's why you need to have that two-way street of communication. So, I mean, I'll come back to you later on, John, but I'd love you to think about maybe some examples of that. I want to turn to, to Tom now, though. And Tom, you know, this kind of partnership between U.S. government and the private sector uh, overseas, a lot of your work focuses on development assistance, of course, infrastructure in particular, uh, technical areas. Um, I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about where you've seen you know, some of the best practices emerging in how U.S. government works with the private sector overseas. Sure. Thank you very much. Let me again say thank you for uh, allowing me to be on the panel today in celebration of this uh, fantastic new fellowship. Um, as a director for policy and program of the U.S. Train Development Agency, I have fortunately a, a firsthand seat in seeing that intersection of where government and private enterprise work and the role that USTDA, which is part of that 1% uh, that John mentioned, part of that 1% of the foreign assistance budget, has that is designed to spur greater private investment in emerging markets. USTDA as an agency is, sets the table for financiers around the world. That includes DFC and XM here, but that includes the World Bank, multilateral development banks. But what does USTDA do? It's a grant-making agency that provides grants to do early project preparation, help our emerging partner countries develop sustainable infrastructure that will drive their economies forward, that is designed to bring U.S. companies, U.S. ideas to the table, but also open those markets for American goods and services, for the export of American technology to balance the trade and opening those doors for American goods and services. And as I was thinking about today's uh, discussion and how do we open those doors, I, I um, read uh, Mr. Gildenhorn's uh, bio. He grew up in Russia, born in Russia, what is now Poland. Um, USTDA today is supporting the feasibility study of a, helping Poland become a nuclear power. The work that USTDA did was to provide that early engineering design study to work by working with the State Department, by working with the Energy Department. We helped Vectel and Westinghouse secure that contract that's going to put Poland as a leader in energy security in Eastern Europe, but do it in a way that's bringing new technologies in and bringing security to the, the broader Eastern European, uh, broader Eastern Europe. Um, but it's not just nuclear. It's also the partnership building, bringing foreign decision makers to the United States, introducing them to American technologies, American ideas. I was fortunate. I was uh, fortunate to travel to Nigeria a number of years ago and was in Lagos and got to go to a teaching hospital in Lagos. And as I was walked around the teaching hospital, it was a cancer treatment center, and it was chock full of American technology, American cancer treatment technology. This cancer setup center was set up as a result of the uh, partnership that USTDA created with American companies. And the teaching hospital was, is set up and now is providing cancer treatment, not only for Nigeria, but for West Africa. And it's that type of work that 
USTDA does, it brings private enterprise together, brings private enterprise to transform countries, whether it's bringing energy security to Eastern Europe, greater, greater health care security to West Africa. Those are the types of projects and opportunities that the U.S. government can and does do to support private enterprise in emerging markets. One thing that I'll push you on there, um, uh, Tom, is whether or not we do a good enough job in advertising or marketing the work that we do around the world, whether it's from the U.S. government or from the private sector, ideally working together. You know, so many times I hear that the United States isn't present. So many times I hear the United States doesn't spend enough on foreign aid or development assistance. It spends an enormous amount on those things, but it seems that the message really doesn't get out there. Are you seeing that in your work? Um, the short answer is, can we do more? Sure. Yeah. I think from USTDA's perspective, we're fortunate. We have significantly expanded our international footprint across the Indo-Pacific, recognizing the strategic competition we face with um, uh, in these markets throughout the Indo-Pacific. We've scaled up our program um, in the Pacific Islands. But all of that is only made possible, to what John was saying, by our embassies, by our foreign commercial service. Um, could we do more? Sure. But we are doing as much as we possibly can do with what we have to really drive American companies and American businesses to be successful in these markets in the face of crazy uh, competition that takes place overseas, where they are facing uh, subsidized goods, um, financing that's at cost or below, below market lane. This is what American companies face, and, and that's the role of agencies like USTDA, DFCXM, to help American companies and private enterprise succeed internationally. And I think that's the point, isn't it, is that you know, we are competing against countries that will open up a checkbook, write a check, or provide low-cost financing for their companies, and we operate in a different way. And we, we absolutely need the partnership between the private sector and the government to do that. And so, Michelle, turning to you, you know, throughout your career, You've seen this, so you've worked in, the, in building this kind of partnership at USAID as assistant administrator. You focused heavily on this. Um, I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about uh, your experience there at USAID, partnering with the private sector to work in developing countries, particularly as it pertains to you know, some of the US uh, geopolitical priorities overseas. Um, I'd love you to talk to us a little bit about some of those US values that John mentioned earlier on that the United States projects out there and how it's not just the government agencies that push those, but also the private sector. Yeah, thank you, Duncan, for that. And again, let me add my um, congratulations uh, to Ambassador Green and to Mrs. Gildenhorn on this wonderful and very timely fellowship. And I'm so glad we're here to talk about this today because I think you know the role of private sector enterprise in today's geopolitical landscape is really important. Go back to um, you know with. Uh, the ambassador was saying at the beginning, right? And it's sort of, how are you competing, right? And when you look at this idea of global competition, right, we really step back and say, what is it that is going to propel America forward, right? And it really comes down to the innovation of our private sector, right? The, the prowess we have there, but it's also this, it's always a battle for hearts and minds. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a little bit of the, the soft power John was talking about, right? It's sort of those values we bring to the table, no matter what country in the world you go to, um, you know, how far off the map, if you will, right? People know America. People love the embodiment of the American dream. And so how do we continue to capitalize on both of those? And I think that's what an agency like USAID did so well. I spent a lot of time in my current job, which I'll, I'll talk about, I'm sure, in a moment as well, at the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition, doing advocacy and education around the United States. One of the things that really struck me is when you talk to people about our work, right, they're not quite always sure what it is. They know the good parts about it, right? We help with humanitarian assistance, right? We are there during your moments of deepest crisis. But we are, by name, a development agency. And really, I would say um, that was a large part of also the rethinking of how do we meet our development goals, right? Particularly in a world we have now, where when you see development challenges, right, they are very intractable. They're very technically um, tricky, if you will. And we also see across the world, right, some of the longest and most protracted crises, right? So what do we bring to bear if we're going to meet those development challenges? So when we were um, at USAID, and I have to give uh, Administrator Green credit for this, or if you didn't like it, he can take the blame for it. 
I am but a protege. Um, but we really had those conversations about, you know, when USAID was started in the 1960s, what did that flow of, um, of funding overseas look like? Well, then it was more, it was the majority public sector funds, a little bit of private sector funds. Well, when we were there, we celebrated the 60th anniversary, what did we see? 90% of all financial flows into emerging markets come from where? The private sector. Less than 10% is from the public sector. So now you have this agency doing international development saying, first of all, our budget alone, right, if we took all the money we had, could probably not even address all the humanitarian issues we have across the world. But we're also a development agency, right? We are trying to build up these countries so that we have better trading partners, so that they are better able to take care of their people, to meet their own development challenges, be that poverty reduction, health outcomes. And we want to do this in a way that creates this global environment that is more secure and it's more stable. Well, how are we going to do that? Well, we started really drilling down and saying, we have to change this paradigm. So what we did is actually kind of threw out the normal operating book and said, we're going to ask ourselves these questions. When we are in a country and we're looking at the challenges we have to address, we're going to step back, step out of our USAID chair, right? And this is really hard, put yourself in your positions. And we're going to say, I'm taking USAID out of it. And I'm going to say this. Is there a market sector approach to addressing this challenge? The second thing we're going to ask ourselves is, can the private sector solve this problem? Mm -hmm. Third, do they have the interest in solving it? Do, do they have a, a keen market um, reason for doing it? And fourth, what barriers or what might they lack on their own to solve these challenges. So once we ask those four questions, then we could get back in the seat and say, okay, that's the role for USAID. It was a complete change in thinking, right? It was how do we harness the, the first of all, the innovation, but also the fact that nine out of 10 jobs around the world are being created by what? The private sector. How do we harness that you know, to meet these development challenges? And what does the private sector need from us? And it became what we kind of internally called the three Cs, right? How do we change this partnership so that when I'm working with the private sector, I'm saying, let's co-create, let's co-finance, let's co-risk. Let's do these three things together. What are you gonna bring to the table? What can I bring to the table? And then how do we both get to our um, perceived goals and, and end game from that? And it was really this change in institutional thinking. I will also say it was, I think, a very welcome uh, change by the private sector as well who had seen these things. We were working side by side in these countries to do that. But it, institutionally, like anything, right, it really changed, it, it required a, a complete overhaul of our processes, our procedures, and our partnerships. Um, but to the end of the day, I think it was, like everything, it was a business case approach to these issues, right? If we don't have everything we need to address this, how do we find the partners that can? It's an awesome answer. I love it. I drill down on one of the one of the LMCs, one of those three C's, and I think it comes under the first one, co-creation. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the work that you've talked about uh, involves technical assistance, mm -hmm. and uh, Tom, you've talked about technical assistance as well. Why don't you give us some examples of the kind of technical assistance that you uh, were involved in at USAID? And I'm going to turn to you, uh, Tom, for some more examples. Okay. Great. Well, and <clears throat> um, I think there are so many, and I'm glad you asked that because there are so many best practices, right? And, and that's what we should talk about. So again, when I go back to US. AID looking specifically at, okay, what can we do that maybe the private sector, again, it's not in their wheelhouse to do, right? And so then I will look at this. We looked at that regulatory reform and enabling environment. That's the role for the public sector that the private sector is not going to immediately be able to affect, right? We spent a lot of time looking at how do we work with our bilateral partners to change the enabling environment so that it is more conducive to that external investment, it's either the foreign direct investment. How do we, in a poverty area where there's a lot of drivers of instability, how do we get US or other private sector companies to want to come in and invest? And a lot of times that had to do with a regulatory environment that was not conducive, right? Um, changing those things so that the business environment was actually attractive. The second thing we would do is really looking again at those market 
based approaches. When the bureau I was in at that time was called um, Development, Democracy, and Innovation. And it was this large technical assistance bureau. And what we did was we took a lens to all of the challenges across the world and we said, what is the technical expertise needed to address this challenge, right? Do we need engineers involved? Do we need climate scientists? Do we need economists? And then we went a step further and said, how do we take the lens to see who are the beneficiaries, mm -hmm. the local partners, what are the people, the programs, the processes, who do we need to be working with and addressing to make sure we meet these goals? This happens a lot in the gender space, right? Mm -hmm. If I'm going to go into a country and I'm going to talk about uh, you know, increasing literacy rates or a GDP, what I have to look at, first of all, is who is that class in society that is most behind the eight ball, right? Because we're going to need to have different interventions, let's say, for women when it comes to literacy than we are for men. And so the technical assistance we did was oftentimes, especially when you talked about poverty reduction or economic growth, was saying, what are the skills we need? That's perfect for USAID, right, to work with our local partners to do. We looked at the market base. We would do you know, an analysis of saying sort of what is the business environment here? What do we know? STEM jobs, fastest growing. Well, I have to tell you, in a lot of the countries we were working with in USAID, we did not have a class of citizenry or unemployed people who had those skills. That's where USAID comes in to work with the private sector to say, hey, we will do skills training in STEM areas. We will work with local universities to give vocational certificates. You come in and provide the jobs. And I think that is a great example of where our technical assistance can be so strong. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, Tom, you talked a little bit about the, uh, the nuclear program in, in, in Poland. What if you give us some other examples of technical assistance? Sure. Thank you. And I, I think that as we look at technical assistance, we have kind of three basic criteria that we're looking at. So is this commercially viable, at least at the outset? Is it financially viable? Is the investment we're going to be making in the feasibility study, in the technical assistance, going to be able to generate financing to implement the project? And lastly, what's the development impact of that? And I think a perfect encapsulation of those three core uh, tenets of our program is a, a win project we're doing in Indonesia right now. It's with a, uh, uh, a uh, Indonesian mining company that is looking to develop 110 megawatts of wind power. But what is that? How do we get to what uh, Senator was saying in a, in, a, in a way that's not subsidized? Well, it just so happens that uh, uh, wind power company is actually a mining company as well. So they've got now an offtake agreement to be buying that wind power that's going to be supporting the mining for critical minerals and rare earth minerals. So now all of a sudden you have a strong partner in Indonesia that is looking to bring new clean energy technology into the grid, but also securing an offtake agreement that will be able to uh, get the financing. And we're talking about development impact. 75% of that wind power is designed to go into the local economy 25% will be into the mining industry. So we're bringing critical minerals into the, into the market to address the, the climate crisis, while also ensuring clean energy is making it to uh, the citizens around, the, around that on the island in Indonesia, but doing it in a way that's going to attract financing and get financial institutions willing to co-finance with a significant power player in the Indonesian market. And it's bringing all those together to going to about where we started, which is private enterprise. How do we drive U.S. private enterprise into these markets? And by bringing together U.S. government resources with a good partner in Indonesia that has the financial and technical wherewithal to do it, that's going to drive U.S. Inter uh, private enterprise into these markets and have the longer term sustainable development we're looking to achieve. And of course, in addition to bringing that source of power, it's essentially greening the value chain for critical minerals, which every company here in the United States is actually looking for right now. They don't just want to have critical minerals that are mined in the old-fashioned way. They want to see them being produced as cleanly as possible. And, uh, you know, critical minerals is an issue we spent a lot of time thinking about here at the Wilson Center. Um, a number of our programs, regional programs, work on critical minerals. Um, we've done a lot of work on the supply chain. Uh, John, I want to come back to you on that because uh, we talked a little bit before 
the panel about uh, critical minerals and how this is really one of the priorities now that you see coming from both the private sector, from the U.S. government, and when you send out, well, I think you said it was 37 uh, dele business delegations last year around the world. These are the kind of things that come back. I wonder if you could talk about how you see that issue shaping up. Um, sure. It's, well, I think the challenge for the energy transition um, uh, comes down to, you know, where are the minerals going to come from? Uh, the Economist says that uh, mineral production is going to have to increase five or six-fold between now and the year 2030 in order to have the minerals that are needed, you know, whether it's copper, lithium, a whole host of metals and minerals. That's a big increase in global mining, and frankly, it's not really happening yet. It's certainly not happening domestically. There's a bit of a mismatch here between domestic policy and rhetoric on the one hand and the, the need to get these metals and minerals. And beyond that, uh, there's the whole question of processing, because uh, while China has um, a, a huge uh, predominant role on the production of many of these uh, rare earths and other critical minerals, um, they have an even stronger hold when it comes to processing. So uh, there's a host of initiatives on this front right now. Uh, the State Department has its uh, Critical Minerals Partnership, working with friends and partners around the world to try and, and see how to... Uh, uh, boost production, but a lot of the time it seems that the focus is largely on uh, labor and environmental concerns, which are absolutely important and need to be addressed. Um, but at the same time, if the conversation is only about those issues and not about how do we actually get more uh, minerals out of the ground, uh, we're, we're kind of stuck. Um, the other piece of the puzzle, I think, is innovation, uh, because the way we see what's needed for the energy transition now may not be what it looks like even two or three years from now due to new technologies that haven't quite been invented yet. Every day we read about this solid state batteries for cars instead of what we have right now. Uh, all kinds of new ideas. So I think we're going to have to be nimble about all of that as well. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good word, nimble. And uh, it's extraordinarily difficult uh, for government for often to be nimble. We'd had a long conversation before this panel about how you turn an organization around and then how that organization begins to work with other organizations in the length and breadth of a government. Um, how do you get everybody on the same page, Michelle? How do you bring everybody together? Because it's all well and good that we talk about partnership and it's a word that people throw around all the time. But how do you actually get people onto the same page? How do you get them in the same room talking about the same thing and finding where those crucial, important interests align? Well, and it seems like such a, a simple and obvious answer, but I don't think we've still cracked the code on it, and that is constant communication. Uh, so I am currently at the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition, and one of the things we do is we are conveners. We have a large... Uh, national network of foreign policy luminaries, um, for-profit businesses, as well as, um, you know, leaders from the national defense. And what brings us together is that we have the shared common goal of America's goal leadership. But to get to that, right, it is constantly bringing everyone to the table. And that is very similar to what we were doing at USAID with private sector engagement, right? It's bringing the government into the same role as the private sector to say, this is a new initiative the government is thinking about launching. Key, we have not launched it yet. We want your buy-in, we want your input. It's not baked. You are here to help inform this, to help educate us, show us where the gaps are, and, and then show us what you bring to the table, what do we bring to the table. And that seems so simple, but I'm surprised at how many times that doesn't happen. And we do that now as an organization where we're constantly, or the private sector will come together. There's so many wonderful private sector coalitions around things like women's economic empowerment. Um, you know, any, any sort of sector you can think about. And they oftentimes have this great brain trust in, in this massive, thoughtful ideas, global reach. Um, but they're also trying to seek those portals into the U.S. government. You know, when you're in the government, let me tell you, it is still a black box. You're still trying to figure out, like, who do you talk to in another organization, and you know that you're there, but it takes a while. Well, you, I'm always trying to, when I was in the government, I always tried to put myself then in the private sector shoe. 
you don't just pick up the phone. You know, there's not a Google, a good, you know, phone number on Google for, hey, I want to partner with private, uh, you know, with the USAID. How do I do that, right? And so for us, it was constantly putting ourselves out there. It's constantly going out, talking to the private sector. What are you working on? Where are our um, strategic alignments? You know, where do we have the strategic alignments? And it's what we do now, but we do it in a way that I think is really interesting. We hold those conversations outside of D.C., and that's the other thing I think that is so important, right? Because we talk here, this is the, you know, this is really where your government relations firms are because this is where the federal government is. But what we do is we take the federal government, we take um, officials from USTDA, from USAID, DFC, et cetera, to the states. And we have them meet with the chambers of commerce. We have them meet with the business leaders. And we bring them outside of DC and we say, you know, I'm an Iowa farm girl, right? Let's talk about the economy here in Iowa. Let's talk about commodities. Let's talk about trade. Um, let's talk about all of these things we, we need to tackle together. And really having that conversation in a real setting that fosters change, right? It's really bringing the policy makers to the people. And that's something I think we need to do so much more about. Because at the end of the day, it really is the idea sharing, but it's the access. It's, it's so funny. I hear two dominant narratives uh, here in Washington. One is that business has too much access to government, and the other one is that government doesn't listen to business, you know? And I think both are true to a certain degree, right? Um, it's that kind of stakeholder engagement where you bring actually a diverse group of people together to try to talk things through. I firmly believe that actually think tanks have a role to play in that because a lot of governments pay lip service to stakeholder outreach and, in fact, are terrible at it. They do it once or twice. They have a, you know, a conference call or a Zoom call, and then that's it. And then they go about the, on their merry way. But uh, coming back to you, John, I mean, you know, this is a lot of your, your, your job. You're, the work of the chamber is to you know, try to get those lessons from business through to, uh, through to government. What are the, the best ways that you've seen that taking place uh, with regards to overseas affairs? Oh, well, I, I don't think that there's really a secret sauce, but you've touched uh, already on, on some of the, the key elements. Uh, you know, uh, members of Congress want to see how it affects their district, uh, stakeholders, and, and being able to speak to them uh, in concert with uh, the state chamber back home, the local chamber back home, um, showing the real world, uh, the faces of trade, as it were, back then. Uh, you know, we often are, are calling attention to some of the 300,000 uh, small and medium-sized businesses that are exporters uh, across the United States. That's something like 98% of all of every exporter is one of those smaller companies. Uh, to humanize it and not just uh, uh, parade a, a host of statistics, I, I tend to fall into lots of statistics and uh, got walk, to gotta walk away from that from time to time. Um, so putting a human face on it is absolutely indispensable. Um, Ambassador Carla Hills always used to, to say, you know, every paycheck um, in an American uh, factory should say, you know, this paycheck came from the North American economy to try to sell people on the idea that, in fact, we need other countries out there. And I think that's a, that's a very good idea to bring it home to people. I want to open up the questions uh, to the audience in a second, but one last question for you, Tom, and that is to do with where you see U.S overseas development assistance moving um, you know, in what remains of this administration. Um, I'm not going to ask you to get out your crystal ball about what happens in November. But you know, the long-term trends here and you know, the priorities that you see around the world. You've talked about uh, uh, Indonesia. You've talked about Poland. You haven't really said anything about Africa so far. I'd love to hear some thoughts about where you see things going with Africa. I did. I did show Nigeria. You did. Sorry. I Sorry, I wasn't going to leave uh, Africa out. Um, you know, I, I think what has been laid out by this administration has been extremely helpful to drive focus under the uh, Partnership for Global Infrastructure Investment, the PGI initiative. It's driven focus across the administration to focus on, and we're being held accountable through our budgeting process. What are you doing in energy? What are you doing in healthcare? What are you doing in uh, digital? And what are you doing in transportation? And I think that focus, I suspect, will continue to drive forward. It's one of those programs that's designed to last because it goes to what are the needs of our partners overseas and where is the U.S. Uh, competitive? Where do we have both a comparative advantage and an absolute advantage? And as I 
look at whether it's a countering China fund or the Indo-Pacific strategy from this administration or last administration. It's all how do we position American companies to be more successful overseas. And I, I think it's that driving focus through PGI, whether it's uh, I think that that has been helpful to hold all of us to account on how we're spending our money and what is the return to uh, the U.S. taxpayer and what are we getting both in U.S. exports and U.S. investment, but also in the long-term stability in the markets we're operating. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Question. We have a question here at the back. Please, if you could introduce yourself. Um, <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> We'd love to get to know you. We can hear you quite well. I'm not sure if the online audience can hear you. Okay. And two articles for The Economist recently last year on uh, uh, deep seabed mining. And right now I'm writing an article, uh, hopefully for foreign affairs, on the impact of Ukraine on the Arctic, particularly uh, looking at hybrid threats up in the Arctic, maritime Arctic. And my question, uh, first, may I congratulate all the changes that have been made at USAID. That's magnificent. And, uh, and I mean that deeply. And uh, a question I would have in terms of the dynamics between corporate and government and community, if you will, uh, is who sets the agenda? Who is it that's defining the priorities? Because that then, an environment fits into that, everything fits into that, except it might not be the right <laughs> uh, choice uh, from, a, from a community perspective. And it sometimes the greatest challenge often uh, is, is to figure that one out, or learn it. And uh, so I wonder, it sounds like you're moving in those kinds of directions. So I'm just wondering how you bring the corporate government piece together in that frame of reference. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. I guess that's a question for you, Michelle, more than anything. <clears throat> yeah, I'd love to take it. It's all about locally led development. And you're asking the exact right question. I think it's the question that, you know, USAID is really trying to answer and, and really to look at. So, for example, um, you know, these solutions that I said, you know, co-create, it really, when I say that I shouldn't, you know, it is private sector, it's U.S. government, it's also our local beneficiaries and partners, right? Um, it has to be solutions for the problems affecting them. So it's, you know, with them, not without them. Um, and that is so important. And so another, I think, really great institutional change, and again, we saw this under Ambassador Green, was really trying to shift this to, you know, where are the programs being developed, right? And that is in the countries, in the missions, right? And so even with private sector engagement, which I oversaw from DC, right? Those deals were largely being made at the missions in the countries. Why? Because those conversations could be had with local beneficiaries, uh, local partners like the NGOs who would help us with the technical assistance that we needed. It was all really about the sustainability because, you know, it, it seems so obvious, but it can be very hard sometimes with how the bureaucracy is, bureaucracy is set up, procurement processes, et cetera, to really step back and say, okay, we know what the private sector is looking for here. We know what we would like to get out of it. But where is that role actually for the beneficiaries and the local partners? And if I, I'm a true believer that if you do not have that locally inspired, that locally led development, you will not meet your objectives. They will not be sustainable. Um, and it's going to take you a lot longer to get there. And I would say, the last thing I would say on that point is at the end of the day, I I can give so many illustrative examples uh, that I'd love to, and I'll give a quick one in India. It is so interesting to me that at the end of the day, all of your goals really align. And there's this one really quickly project we worked on, and it was one of these things where we were sitting literally at a table and we had all these aha moments, right? We had this large consumer products company who you know, saw the population of consumers in India and said, you know, we want to increase um, the amount of product we're growing, but we can't because it's really expensive because of the per safety procedures we require our farmers to use and because of the cost of the, the seeds because we use a very specific um, seed. And at the same time, we were really struggling with a poverty pocket for women who were struggling s to get out of poverty and were um, farmers but could not get leases to the land they were farming on. 
And so we kind of sat back and we're like, this is all coming together, right? Because we have all these women farmers who will do it for you. And they don't care that's going to cost them a little more up front because they know what they'll make on, on the back end with you. And it, it's just, it is so interesting when you come together. I have rarely in my career, and I've been in, in international development my entire career, seen a case where the three sides did not align on an issue or we couldn't all find our role in it. At the end of the day, that was one of our most successful private sector partnership programs. We came in, we helped change with the government of India changed local laws to allow women to lease land in their own name. The women became economically empowered and the consumer company made a return on their investment, right? They made a profit. Everyone wins. It looks a little bit different, but as long as you all going into it knowing what your piece, your stake is, I, I don't think there's many times where that can go wrong. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, John, for a, a vibrant and fascinating discussion. Thank you once again, Alma, uh, for letting us do this today. Um, and I'd like to thank our colleagues in the development department who worked so hard to put this all together, and of course the folks in, uh, uh, in external relations, and particularly AV, who make us all look and sound good. I'm glad you've got the handsome filter on today yes. <laughs> um, for those online. Um, I would invite you all to join us for a reception immediately following this, where we can celebrate the Guildenhorn Fellowship. And thank you so much for being here today.